We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and neither of us are in expected locations at the moment. Nope, we are Carmen San Diegoing at the moment. So, where in the world are you, Catherine? <laughs> Um, ironically enough, I am near San Diego. I am in California, um, running a summer camp. So yeah, it's going to be a fun couple of months between this and the podcast and everything. And where are you? Um, still in Buenos Aires. I'm still in Argentina, but I'm in my last three weeks here. Last three weeks of portable Wi-Fi. Um, and then so I left my apartment. I'm in an Airbnb. So in a different part of the city. So enjoying my last three weeks, but excited to come home. So yay. Nice. So because it's summer and because Emily is wrapping things up in Argentina, um, our upload schedule is going to be a little bit flexible for the last, next few weeks uh, <laughs> because time is difficult to carve out when you're running a summer camp and your co-host is four hours ahead of you in the time zones. Um, so just keep an eye on the going off track Instagram going dot off dot track um, for updates on when we'll be uploading. We will probably mostly be like normal, but in the case of today where it is Friday in your world, as you are listening to this, um, when it drops. Um, and we usually upload our, our predictions on Thursdays. And we have a lot of news to talk about between uh, Monaco and Canada, right? We do. And excitingly enough, we get to start with contracts, my absolute favorite. So coming out of yep. Monaco, I think we could all kind of expect this one, maybe not being announced so soon. But Esti Basti is leaving Alpine after this season. So he will not be renewing a contract with the team. They are not going to keep the all French lineup that we kind of thought that they would. Um, I know we were kind of talking about it in our like way too early silly season predictions that, you know, we could see them keeping the all French team. Um, they are not after, after we recorded that for the season of 2024, not surprising. Um, Jack Duhon is ale the alleged front runner for the, his seat. Um, I personally would like to see Mick Schumacher kind of throw his hat in the ring. Um, but yeah. yeah, so now I have no idea where Esteban Ocon is going to go. I honestly, I had him in Alpine or off the grid. So for me, I maybe think he won't be back next year. I don't know. You know, it, it's interesting because this is not kind of not the first time that he he's had to quote take a year off, but this might be a little bit more than a year if he doesn't, you know, find another seat on the grid. Um, but yeah, I, I really it's not that I didn't see this coming because we all kind of saw this coming after Monaco and kind of after how the season really, really started, you know, the Viva La France was not really the Viva La Francing, so to speak. Um so I, the, the question is, is, is where is he going to go? Obviously he has, you know, Mercedes ties because Toto Wolf is his manager. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, the Kimi Antonelli of it all makes the Mercedes seat, you know, a really big question. And uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't know where he's going to go. He's kind of implied that he's been having conversations with other teams, but so do all of the drivers. Um, I mean, I, I just heard a rumor this morning that Carlos Sainz has signed a contract. I don't know what that means, um, but it'll be interesting. And also to, to speak about Jack Dewan, who I do really think is a front runner for an Alpine seat. Um, I, he will be replacing Ocon this weekend today, probably as you are listening to this in a free practice one. So uh, Alpine is very quick to get him into, you know, a seat to get it some practice and get some some kilometers under him yeah I love the meme speaking of like this whole movement in Alpine I love the meme where it's like a year ago they had Oscar Piastri Fernando Alonso yeah. and Esteban Ocon and now they have zero and it's like yeah I mean, it's, it, but we kind of expect it's wild from the team. like they're doing a huge overhaul with like operationally all their roles and reorganizing their yeah. towers whatever you want to call it so this truly doesn't surprise me. It honestly wouldn't surprise me either if Gasly didn't get a seat. Like, I can see them just doing a complete overhaul of everything top down, especially with a huge, like, investment group coming in and buying part of the team, so... 
Yeah, that's that's the really interesting wrinkle to it. Some somebody um, threw out there that maybe um, Yuki Sonoda should just go and reteam up um, with Pierre at Alpine, um, which I think would be hilarious and incredibly unlikely. Um, but I, I I do think that you know Alpine is is a lot happier with with Gasly right now, and I don't right. think that they would be necessarily in the position to you know go for a completely brand new lineup so i think that they would want to have at least some consistency and i think that on you know gasly's side if you know esteban is is leaving then alpine might be a better situation for him now that his teammate is going to be going elsewhere slash potentially off the grid now that his teammate isn't trying to crash into him (laughs) constantly I mean, we still have a lot more races, so you know. I I, I think that there's you know time. Alpine and, and <laughs> there there's 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 definitely still time for for them to to collide at least once more. Uh, well, moving on from Alpine because I know we could talk about that dynamic forever. Um, oh but yeah. Another, I'll say exciting loosely, depending on what side of the coin you're on, but. It- and we know it's announcement not announcement for contracts. Um, Checo has extended with Red Bull until 2026. So this, so I want to say it didn't surprise me, but it kind of did. I did not think they would give him a two year contract. I thought that they right, would him right. at the end, only giving him a one year. We've talked about this before. He'll only get one year. Then someone else will come in. I mean, a contract's a contract. You can always get out of it. A la Daniel Ricardo at McLaren. But the two year was super surprising to me. Um, I don't want to say super, but it was it was unexpected. No, no, it was definitely unexpected. I, I had the same reaction. I was really surprised that they were going to give him two years too, um, just because they they really just didn't seem to want to. And everything that we had heard, you know, going into the announcement was he was going to get another one year. It's not what he wanted, but obviously he was going to stay with Red Bull because a where else would he go, and why would he, you know, kind of you know want to screw with a sure thing. Exactly. But another just thought in my mind is if they knew that it was going to happen, why are they doing it so early? Like, I understand why they did it, but it's just so weird that we're seeing all this contract movement outside of the traditional silly season. And it's like, is silly season going away? Like, do we not? It does it not exist anymore. I think for this season, it doesn't. I, I, I think that we could potentially have, you know, all of the major seats decided by the end of the summer. Um, obviously, we're still waiting on Carlos. Um, now we have the questions with both Sauber drivers. Um, so the, the real question is going to be, you know, how soon? But I, we could all thank Lewis Hamilton for making the teams make these moves because we had, you know, behind the scenes before Lewis made the announcement, we had Ferrari locking Charles down. We had McLaren locking Lando down. Piastri's already been locked down there. And then, of course, Lewis made the Ferrari announcement, which threw everyone for a spin um, from a fan perspective. Um, And, you know, now it's the teams have to announce these drivers as soon as they get them so that everybody else kind of knows where they're going. Yeah. And I think maybe this is an anomaly of a year because we had so many open seats. Yeah. It only took that one domino to fall of Lewis Hamilton to kind of make mm-hmm. everybody else scramble. So maybe we, maybe you're right. Maybe we will go back to, you know, a normal one. But this year, I, I definitely agree that we'll have all the seats locked down before summer. Except for like Carlos. Yeah. I'm so, we, I could sit and talk until I'm blue in the face, which I say every single time we talk about this, about Carlos and where he's going mm-hmm. and all of this yeah. nonsense. I just want to know. But it's crazy that we knew in February he wasn't going to have a seat and it's just snowballed and now there's no good seats left. And it's like, I can't imagine, you know, Carlos, a race winner this year and last year ending up in like a Williams with Albon. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I think it, it, it also could speak to from, from the Williams perspective, some ambitious plans that they have because going from, you know, you know, Williams wants to take themselves out of the situation where they are a, you know, a training team, a feeder team. They have Alex Albon who has a lot of experience, you know, getting another driver like Carlos with experience and hopefully getting a car that isn't fat um, will, you know, 
do do better. And speaking of, of cars that are, are are not overweight, we did get the announcement of the new regulations this morning. We have so much to talk about about the new regulations. Um, it's Thursday, June 6th as we talk about this, um, but we do not have time to fit that all into this episode. Um, so we will have a full episode on the updated regulations coming soon to a podcast near you. We can probably talk about it, honestly, in our Canada recap, because we'll have time to talk about it. I'm sure they'll talk about it on the broadcast this weekend. So, you know, we can do some digging there. But before we get to Canada, um, also some fun off track stuff. Lewis Hamilton did Hot Ones. I was, I was really into it. That was a great episode. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this. You're not a huge Lewis fan. I, you know, admire and appreciate what he does for the sport. Um, but when right, he exactly. talks, like, you never know what you're going to get from him. And so I was like, this could be incredibly bad or, like, incredible. And I leaned more towards incredible. I 100% agree. Like, to actually get him to confess to peeing in the car, <laughs> like, let's be real. I did not see that one coming. Um, no. And like, he just, he completely and totally lost his mind toward, toward the end there. Um, and uh, the host whose name is escaping me right now because my brain's a little fried from moving into camp. Um, he's a really great interviewer because he wasn't asking the same questions. Like, how traumatized are you by Max Verstappen winning in 20, uh, 2021? Um, we didn't have that. We had a lot of like, just, you know, Lewis did make a little dig about his struggles with the Mercedes car. Um, but it was really just about what it's like to be a driver and what it's like to be a high performer, which is something that I really appreciated out of the interview that we really don't see when it comes to like the traditional type of driver interview. No, I, I completely agree. And that's like when Lando did the chicken shop uh, podcast or whatever it's called. Um, I like when they kind of ask oh, yeah, more, yeah, yeah. like off the grid questions and just, and not like the dumb questions that we just constantly get for the drivers. I like when it's different. I like when we get more of their personality. Um, so that's, it's always fun. And, you know, I think Lewis Hamilton's a perfect person to do hot ones. So. Yeah. And I, I loved how like he was afraid to do it. And he's like, apparently had like rescheduled it three separate times. Cause he was just like busy. Cause he's, you know, traveling the world and all that fun stuff. But then also like, you know, kind of intimidated because the hot ones is kind of scary. You yeah. know, if you're, if you're not used to eating spicy foods and let's be real, Lewis is British and they don't really have a lot of like spicy cuisine typically in the UK. Uh, but if you haven't watched it, highly suggest it. Um, it's, pr- it's super easy to find, but it's, it's really entertaining. It was a good one. Yeah. So turning away from Formula One a little bit, but still related to Formula One, um, I thought this news was really interesting. Um, Obviously, Gene Haas, who owns the Haas F1 team, um, he has a lot more ties to other racing circuit, you know, racing teams in America, including Stuart Haas, which is their NASCAR outfit. And news broke last week you know, or even a few days ago, I don't know, time is, has really blended together between me moving from Arizona Welcome to California to temporarily. <laughs> um, right though. I, it, it, this is, this is weird. Um, but the news broke that they are shutting down their NASCAR outfit, Stuart Haas at the end of the season. And what I felt was really interesting is the FIA president, the date, the like hours before this was announced, um, Mohammed Ben Sulaim, the um, FIA president changed his mind. And I'm using air quotes. If you're listening to this on, on a, a non-video platform about Andretti joining formula one in his 11th team and said, ooh, you know, maybe your best bet is to buy an existing team. And I just thought that that was a really convenient piece of timing because we know Andretti wants to get into Formula One. We've had, you know, we've had the FIA support for an 11th team. And now the 11th, the, the FIA is saying, hmm, maybe we'll keep it to 10, but you can buy another team. What team could be available? What's the writing on the wall here? And if I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on, my tinfoil hat is saying that Gene Haas wants to get out of F1. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to know that Gene Haas is not happy being a part of F1. (laughs) Um, He seems very... Yeah. I mean, maybe in the the early seasons, but as of late, it just feels like he's very distant. NASCAR was really his thing. His other, you know, pieces of motorsport are more 
he I would say his attention is there more maybe than F1. F1, the, uh, the Haas team was really Gunther yeah. and now Gunther's gone. So I think it's, I don't know. I mean, let's be real. Haas did an incredible thing of coming to the grid, you know, out of out um out the gate, but they haven't done anything really remarkable recently. And I know that they're low on money. No, I, I mean that, not really since they started. Right, exactly. And they're low on money, and I can see Gene seeing it as just a you know a money pit, and it's a perfect way for Andretti to come onto the grid. It's they're buying another American team. You know, I think it would be good. Yeah, and I I think that we still need better American representation in Formula One, you know, not to say, you know, anything against the Haas outfit or Logan Sargent, who is the American driver at the moment. Um, But, you know, American fans, the more, like, have more ties to Max Verstappen, Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris, Charles Leclerc, Carlos Sainz, Lewis Hamilton, than they do, you know, the actual American team on the grid because the actual American team on the grid has not performed. And then there was that whole little Russia thing with the Mazepins um, that, you know, if, if you know, you know, and if you don't, just look it up. Um, <laughs> like, awkward. Um, so I, and and also I think that, you know, amidst Alpine's struggles, I saw this morning, you know, Alpine is once again saying, you know, we're not for sale. Um, and and you you would think that Alpine and Haas are kind of the two, I wouldn't say more vulnerable outfits, but they are the ones that have the best opportunity to be bought out. Um, yeah. And Alpine saying, no, no, it's not happening. We're fine. Um, and Haas hasn't really said anything. And Haas is really just focusing on trying to keep Kevin Magnuson from getting a race ban, which could very well happen this season if the FIA, you know, sticks to its rules, which I don't think they will, but that's an entirely different story. Honestly, though, I want to see it. Like, I love K-Mags, and he is a human wrecking ball. Um, but I think it'd be really just interesting to see what happens and the fallout and what people say. And I don't know. Why not? Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, there there was a lot of chatter after after Monaco of um, the you know the race stewards not um, not even you know they they noted the incident but they didn't look into the incident. And I know that you know the Red Bull camp was like, well, why didn't they look into the incident? It was a little bit more than a racing incident in their opinion, yeah. um, and that's kind of the the first the the opening lap gray area with you know Magnuson's crash into his teammate and in, in Sergio Perez, um, but yeah, I which I I don't think he should have gotten more penalty points for that. I think that they they made the right call and that they didn't give him you know the penalty, but I don't think they made the right call in not at least reviewing the incident. Agreed, agreed. If they would have reviewed and said no racing yeah. incident, it's fine. I think it would have been a better look for them and just setting a yeah. precedent. So. Which they, you know, we, we know that F1 sets bad precedents, like my favorite thing, the minimum lap time. We don't need to talk about that, but I think it's time that we talk about no. the Canadian Grand Prix. We're going to Montreal. Yep. Okay. Lance Stroll's home race. And Oscar Piastri. <laughs> well, he hasn't been adopted by the Stroll family yet. Social media has been clamoring for it, but but we we you have not have heard um, of that of, one. Of... <laughs> That was kind of my thought. Is is is, is Alonso gonna let um, Lawrence Stroll adopt another former Alpine driver? I'm dead. Honestly, I want to see how far this joke goes and like how much Oscar just builds on this. I'm loving the social media aspect and and the trolling and and the jokes. It's it's made for some off track entertainment. Yeah, it's been. I'm I'm curious once we get to like Max's home race, how that's gonna go. I know. I want to see what like, he well, Ma- Like, is Max going to play ball? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Max seems like uh, he has a good sense of humor. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I am, um, and I can, I can definitely see it. I could, I could definitely see like Yost Verstappen, you know, bringing, bringing some um, adoption papers to the track. Oh my god! I just like I never forget about Yost, but I do, and I just now that you said it, right? I don't know who I want to get involved more. Lawrence Stroll or Joost Verstappen? Oh, oh, that could be interesting. And then, oh, God, I, I think, oddly happen. enough, Catherine, 
it's going to snowball. And then we're going to have like a war of like, who is going to adopt Oscar Piastri. And like, I can just see this going way too far. And then Nicole coming in and being like, no. (laughs) Well, I mean, that depends on if, if Nicole Piastri, Oscar's mom has gotten an answer from Yuki yet, because if Yuki's happy to be adopted um, by, you know, Australian family, then that that might just be... (laughs) Yuki can cook really well, so. Sorry, Oscar, your skills in the kitchen suck. We're picking Yuki over you. The tribe is spoken. Yeah. Anyway, the Canadian Grand Prix has been happening for for a while. Um, Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, most driver wins with seven. Um, Ferrari has dominated from a constructor standpoint. They've had 14 wins. Um, We have some um, changes to the track. They resurfaced between um, last year's race and this year's race. The track's already low grip, so it might not change much. Um, but we'll see. Um, and they've also added some grass to turn nine. So it's no longer an asphalt runoff. So we might be getting a little bit of lawn mowing. Um, and I, 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 you know, I understand, you know, grass makes a a better challenge for the drivers, but also Canada is known for its groundhogs. So I think it's really interesting of like, why are you giving another opportunity for groundhogs to burrow into the track and, you know, put the drivers and the groundhogs themselves at risk by walking onto the track like that's that that's an interesting thought that I had when I woke up this morning because my brain's a little fried no I I mean all week I've been seeing the groundhog you know footage from years past and I didn't have that exact thought but you bring up a very valid point so and I think it'll also be interesting with grass and potential of rain as well, because that's just like a recipe yes. for disaster. So as of right now, the weather forecast is 50% chance of rain on Friday, 60% on Saturday, and then 50% again on Sunday. Um, I'm here for it. I yep. think we haven't had a crazy, crazy weather race yet. I know we had some rain in China, um, but I want like a full wet and wild weekend, so... Here's to hope in Canada. Yeah, and I think we're going to be a little bit more likely to get that than, you know, obviously we had, you know, a rain prediction for Monaco that didn't, you know, play out for, and it would have been Monaco qualifying. But I think that, I think we're actually going to get a, a wetter, you know, weather situation this weekend, um, which could be really interesting, could be really exciting, um, could cause a lot of chaos. There are some drivers who they might not necessarily do well in the dry, but they do really well in the wet. And Lance Stroll, oddly enough, is one of them yeah and all i know is that it's just going to destroy our predictions <laughs> oh yeah our, our predictions are screwed so and you know i looked at last year's you know results max had pole max won. fernando was p2 lewis was p3 and perez had fastest lap i don't think we're gonna see much like this except maybe the max parts if he manages to pick things back up from you know you know, recovering a little bit from what happened in Imola and in Monaco. Yeah, they've come out and said that Red Bull's going to have a really tough Rough weekend. time, yeah. Right. But I don't know. I mean, it hasn't been sunshine and rainbows completely like it was, you know, maybe last No, it really year, hasn't. So. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at it, we could we could have every opportunity to have a new leader in the Constructors' Championship for the first time since, I believe, 2022 um, because um, – Ferrari is only 24 points behind Red Bull right now. Yeah. Well, with that being said, should we get into our 2024 predictions for the Canadian Grand Prix? Yes, we should. All right. So we pick pole, podium, and P10, and we give ourselves points if we get them correct. Lately, Catherine and I have been choosing the same predictions unknowingly. How fun is that? Um, But I'm going to tell you right now, Catherine, I don't think you're going to have any of my predictions because I'm just throwing pasta at a wall and hoping it sticks at this point. So for poll, who do you have? Um, I went back to Max for poll. Whether or not that's actually going to play out, I I don't know. But 
we'll see. Um, I think, you know, Max is, is raring to, to go and have a recovery race. And Max does notoriously do well in the Max Verstappen revenge tour on races, you know, on races after ones that he does not win. So I'm going to see about Max picking things back up, whether or not Red Bull actually struggles is, you know, also is, is Red Bull going to struggle as a team is different from is Max going to struggle as a driver who is a savant in that Red Bull car. <laughs> I love the word savant. Um, no, I think that's, I right. think that's super fair. Um, I have Lando, so I'm back on my Lando train. Okay. Yeah. Um, and All then right. for your podium, I can see that. who do you have for your podium? So my podium is going to be Max Lando Carlos. And please tell me we don't have the same podium. We do not because okay. I have Lando Max. Finally. Carlos. <laughs> so I have Lando winning his second race ever. <laughs> Barely. And, and his second race of the year. We have the same podium, but not in the same order, but we are thinking alike. I'm going to guess that we might also have the same oops, tracks just based on <laughs> our podiums. So, uh, but before we get to that, uh, our last position or our last prediction that we pick is P10. P10 is the last um, place where you earn points. You get one point for P10. So Catherine, who do you have for P10? So my P10 is Fernando. Oh, okay. So I picked the other and I picked Stroll. Oh, so interesting. The brother so it's an Stroll all Aston Martin P10. The brother Stroll. Yeah, ooh, that that could that could be yeah, I, I went with Fernando just because, you know based on where he had finished last race and based on where he's kind of been, obviously I want to see him higher up. Um, but I think, you know, P10 is something that he should be shooting for. And also, and I, I didn't know this, know this after Monaco. Um, and I saw this the other day, he thought he was driving in P10 for a good 50 laps in Monaco and had no idea he was actually P11. Yep. I saw that. I was like, Oh man, I love that. That's gotta him. suck. <laughs> um, but that's no, I hilarious. Also think- I picked Stroll, one, because it's Canada, and I think he's kind of always on the cusp of, like, points, no points. Right. So I thought that was a, you know, an okay pick. It's really depressing to see where Aston yeah. has been this year. Yeah, I really want them to be not where they are. Like, I, I really liked where Aston Martin was last season on the first half of the season, and I'd really like to see them get back to that. Yeah. Well, there's always, you know... 20 more races or however many races we have left 14 17 yeah too many ever. something like that no a, million. a million so many um okay so moving on to just the predictions we make for fun we don't actually award ourselves points for these um biggest surprise what is your biggest surprise of the weekend um my biggest surprise is Haas is going to have a clean weekend this weekend <laughs> sorry I don't mean to yeah. laugh but like okay it would be a surprise, though, clearly. Um, it would be, exactly. And that's what that that's what the prediction is. Yeah. So I guess this is a surprise. Maybe not. But especially coming off of Monaco, where there was absolutely no movement, I think we're going to see a lot of overtaking and a completely different grid from start to finish. I like that. Yeah. The, I mean, I think we had, what, four overtakes in Monaco, and th- there were like 30-something overtakes in, in Canada last, last year. So not a lot of overtakes compared to some other races that we've had, but a hell of a lot more than we had in Monaco. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then the last one we have here is who's going to do a dumb? So what is the oops of the weekend going to be? I think our oops is inevitably going to be Alpine. I don't think it's because they're going to collide with each other because I think Bruno Fahmann will actually like drag Esteban Ocon out of the car from the track if he does cause any any damage uh, to Pierre specifically. But I do think that Alpine is going to struggle this weekend. Okay, I thought we would have the same oops um, just based on our podium, but I guess we don't. I have... Charles is just gonna shit the bed after winning Monaco. <laughs> He's at like I mean, his all time high, awesome. and there's nothing like you know the Canadian Grand Prix to really just bring it back down to earth. 
Yeah, I mean, he he doesn't have a good history in French speaking tracks. If we think of France from a couple of years ago, um, and with uh, no, I am stupid was not France. That was Baku, um, but France was when he put it. In, oh, France was when he put it in the wall and then just yelled really loudly on the radio. Like that was the radio call, which is him screaming. So that could be um, an, an option. And yeah, I can I can also see that coming. Yeah. Oops. Oops. I don't know. I, I've had a lot of, I've been doing a lot of soul searching and I'm just not sure I can support Ferrari going forward. This might be my last season as a Ferrari fan. Just, I don't know. I don't, I don't love what's going on at Ferrari. And I think, you know, me ragging on Charles is an indicator of that, but I might be a whole new woman next season, Catherine. We'll have to see. Yeah. You might be wearing Williams gear if if that's where uh, Carlos goes. Oh, that's not a huge challenge. Are you kidding me? Hanging out with JV, sold. Yeah, you mean <laughs> Surprised that, I don't have a Williams. That's true. I, I would Williams also. We're always Team Williams, but we'll yeah. see. Anyways, always. final thoughts yes. on Canada. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to get back to, you know, some more, tr- not traditional, but wider tracks like we've talked about before. Imola and Monaco are super narrow. It's really hard to pass. Canada will see, you know, Back to some of the racing that we're used to, more overtaking, more excitement, maybe. Um, people not, you know, falling mm-hmm. asleep on lap three and waking up and the race is over. Oh, uh, Monaco. So I'm excited. It'll be good. I've mm-hmm. missed racing. We've had a week off, so... Yeah, yeah, I, I've I've missed racing. I'm excited to get back to it. Um, also to to note, Canada was the first Grand Prix that the Going Off Track Instagram account um started following last year. The, like we are we are getting towards like anniversary time on the podcast. Yeah, we, we are coming up on um the the anniversary of me waking up on a beach to discover that um Nick DeVries has been fired from Alpha Tauri and that Daniel Ricardo is coming out of his third uh third driver position to to drive um for them which no one saw coming and of course had had us start our podcast uh, about a month before we expected but yeah it's it's anniversary season i'm also really, just really excited um to i'm i'm excited to be at camp while also fo- following formula 1 apparently there are a lot more people who follow formula 1 at camp now so i actually have like people to talk about the sport with which is also very exciting. Um, and I inevitably might also feature somebody barging into my room wanting to, you know, insert themselves to the podcast. So we'll, we will see how that goes. Privacy Welcome is not to the unhinged season get here at camp. of going off track. <laughs> Yes, yes, de- definitely going to be that. But from a from a race standpoint, I'm also just really excited to to see what you know what these drivers look like. We've had a lot of upgrades come in, um, and just to see how they're going to handle things on a track that is a little bit more conducive to modern Formula One cars. Because we know that Imola, we we talked about how Imola is not, and we we know how um, Monaco is not. Um, so it'll be interesting to see that. But I, I am really excited to see what this race uh, turns out to be this weekend. No, I think it's going to be a really interesting race to see all the upgrades we've gotten since Miami, because Miami, there were a few, Imola, we had more, so it'll be interesting to see um, how the upgrades actually, you know, handle on a more traditional, and yeah, pan out on a more modern track, so. Well, with that, Catherine, it's the end of the episode. So we have your F1 fun fact. So what is your F1 fun fact for us today? So going back to the 2011 Canadian Grand Prix, which was won on the last lap in what apparently was a thriller by Jensen Button, um, that race holds the record for the longest total race time in Formula One history in over four hours and four minutes. Interesting. Yeah. Why? Because two hours was taken up by a rain delay. And this was before we had the current time limit rules that Formula One has. So I think back then it was just kind of, we live with it. And then obviously the time limit rules were readjusted again, um, or at least the, the way points are, are divvied out in a delayed race or in a, in a weather shortened race after um, spa in 2021. Um, but yeah, they, they just kind of waited for it and then it happened, which actually kind of reminds me of um, the Indy 500, which they didn't know if they were going to get the race in that, you know, on the day at all because the weather had been so bad that morning and the end of the Indy 500 was actually a little bit unhinged and kind of wild. Um, and also the guy who won um, garden, he said that Indy car drivers could make it into formula one and like, 
like, yes, you can debate and there's probably some IndyCar drivers that could do well in Formula One, but we all do know that like, IndyCar is where Formula One drivers who can't stay in Formula One go to continue their racing career. Um, there, there are a number of former Formula One drivers who are on the um, IndyCar grid right now. So I thought that those comments were just really cute. Not Catherine throwing IndyCar under the bus in the last two minutes of the episode. Uh, Oops, right, did well, that just happen? <laughs> well... Up next, we will have our uh, Canada recap episode out probably Monday, TBD. Thanks for being flexible probably. with us in our crazy schedules over the next few weeks, um, especially during camp season with Catherine. But that has been our prediction episode for the Canadian Grand Prix. Thanks for going up, Jack, with us, guys.